As an educator um, today and over the past 25 years, I've been really, really fortunate to be involved with some of the most talented students uh, one could want to be in a company of. In my early days being at Loyola University, Brian Blade was a student of mine. At uh, the University of New Orleans, Nicholas Payton, Christopher Thomas, who also played with Jeremy, I mean, who also played with Joshua Redman along with Peter Martin, who wasn't a student of mine, but he played one of my early bands and recorded with me. I've just been in, in touch with so many talented young musicians who are hungry to learn. So I think what I've been able to give them is a sense of honesty and tradition that has been passed down to me through my teachers, Ellis Marcellus, Carl Bluen, uh, Edward Hampton. These are some names from New Orleans that you know and others that you don't know. Um, David Lasty, that name may not sound familiar to anyone, but it's Hurlin Riley's uncle. And it was a family of musicians called the Lasty Brothers. Harold Baptiste, who was a great producer, who is a great producer, he's still alive. Um, he produced Sonny and Cher as well as Dr. John. So as an educator, I've taken those traditions not only from the classroom, but from the personal experience I've dealt with with, with my elders and bring it to my students. So um, one of the great advantages and rewards is to be able to perform with your students. So I have tried to incorporate that over the years. And there have been so many great people coming out. I mean, obviously, being here in Detroit and a young man who's with Mac Avenue Records that I'm very, very proud of, I have to say, is Aaron Deal because he's a former student of mine from my time at Juilliard, and we've done a lot of work together. He's recorded with me, and um, he's just a fantastic young musician. I think if you, you look at a lot of musicians from New Orleans, or maybe from all over the world, it's not just New Orleans, but obviously my group of, my generation of people, you see as we come dressed to the bandstand. And um, I have always been taught personally, you dress for success. If you're going to try to get a bank job, you're not going to, most people are not going to go in an outfit that doesn't represent what that particular gig calls for. Um, I just feel good when I'm in a suit. I think people like to see me in a suit when I come dressed for the gig. Um, for me, it's what becomes my work clothes when I go to play and when I go to teach. I have a lot of colleagues who don't wear suits to, to work. I wear a suit every day to work because I think immediately it, it sets me apart. It sends a message to my students or if I'm performing to my audience that I came to work ready to play. Um, it doesn't mean that a guy who doesn't wear a suit doesn't come ready to play. It's just for me is what makes me feel good about it. And um, I have to say Winton actually kind of re rejuvenated that for my generation of people when he was playing with all Blake and the Jazz Messengers. But if you also look at the greats, the all greats of the greats, particularly this one gentleman that always has been in a suit each and every time you've ever seen him. Hank Jones from Flint, Michigan. Mr. Jones was clean every time you saw him. I mean, the last time I saw him, he had on a suit, white shirt, tie, you know, um, always. Joe Wilder is another person. Um, there's tons of them. Benny Golson is always clean. John Hendricks, perfect example, always clean. Um, and if you look at the history of all of the jazz greats, they were always at their best, very well dressed. It wasn't until the 50s and the 60s that things started to, the dress code started to take a secondary role to the music, I think. But I think prior to that, you saw musicians dressed as well as came ready to play. In entertainment in general, I always say that people don't fail because they can't do whatever their specialty is. They fail because they never learn how to take care of business. Sammy Davis Jr., Red Fox, Ed McMahon, Dionne Warwick. Now, they're not failures in terms of the, of the um, recognition they have in the world. Dionne Warwick had an $80 million debt with the IRS. Into IRS. We know that Sammy Davis was raped by the IRS by the time he died. Wesley Snipes was incarcerated. Right. I mean, you know, all those are lack of business skills that somebody neglected to teach them along the way. There's no way you can make $30 million and think you don't have to give $10 million of it to the IRS. And if you think, if, you, if you're that lost on skills and think you're not going to pay your taxes when you make that much money, you're a fool. And I, you can't be a fool in business, and this is a business. All of it is a business. Yeah. Hello, I'm Victor Goins, and I rock jazz.